look, Bitcoin is of limited supply. And yes, over the last 10 years, the dollar has gone down 99% against Bitcoin. But just understand this, every single asset that exists in the world has gone down 99% against a Bitcoin, right? If you do that chart, Anthony and I have talked about this before. So it's not about, um, it's not about the dollar going away. It's about investing in an asset where the supply is limited. That is a unique asset that uh, is at the core of the entire digital asset ecosystem, the entire digital asset world. So that's something that's very valuable and that has achieved network effect already. Despite the official narrative that all is well, the past few years events have significantly eroded confidence in the US dollar. The excessive money printing in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the decision to allow inflation to run much too hot before the Fed acknowledged the problem have all contributed to this. The faulty narrative that the United States can afford to print as much as it wants because it is a superpower and the issuer of the world reserve currency further adds to the concern. This is exactly why a video of Jared Bernstein, the chair of the United States Council of Economic Advisors, recently went viral on Twitter. Despite being a major driving force behind our economic policies, Bernstein found it difficult to explain how the government cannot just print money out of thin air or why that would be devastating for the economy if that's actually happening. In his words, the US government can't go bankrupt because we can print as much money as we need. When he made this statement, Bernstein either didn't realize that there's a difference between printing money and lending it through bond issuance, or he just made the biggest Freudian slip, and the US government does create money out of thin air, something officials have denied for years. Above all, the video revealed the arrogance, ignorance, and recency bias common with policymakers like Bernstein, who absolutely refuse to acknowledge there's a problem that requires urgent attention. This lack of acknowledgement should be a cause for concern as it could lead to a situation similar to Japan's, where the yen is currently trading at multi-decade lows against the US dollar due to a string of unfortunate economic policies. These experts have drawn parallels between Japan's 260% debt to GDP ratio and the United States 130% debt to GDP ratio. According to Dan Tapiero, the CEO and managing partner at 10T Holdings, the US dollar might be the world's reserve currency and one of the highest valued currencies in the world, but it is gradually losing its dominance. Unlike some other prominent personalities in the digital assets space, Tapiero is not predicting the imminent demise of the dollar or a doomsday scenario that will suddenly see the dollar lose its relevance among fiat currencies. However, he acknowledges that the increasing popularity and adoption of Bitcoin poses a challenge to the dollar's dominance. Tapiero foresees a future where Bitcoin is a major reserve currency and the dollar is only viewed as an alternative. He discussed his views on the US dollar, the US economy, and Bitcoin in a recent interview with Opto alongside Skybridge Capital's Anthony Scaramucci. As we present clips from the highly insightful conversation, please take a little time to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Everything you do helps with the YouTube algorithm and immensely contributes to the channel's growth. Thanks and enjoy the video. I think we're through the regulatory chasm at this point. Mm -hmm. I think it's more or less safe to say. I know that there's an election coming up and uh, Trump is pro-Bitcoin and Biden supposedly Bitcoin, but Trump was against Bitcoin before he was for it. And it feels like Biden is pivoting now closer to digital assets because they did allow for these Ethereum ETFs. But it doesn't matter because the average age of the people that are voting for it, Republican and Democrat, are in their 40s. The people that are voting against it are in their 70s and 80s. So I think we're through the regulatory chasm. Mm -hmm. And I think where we where we have to look now is use cases, utility, uh, expansion of literally being able to email Dan money anywhere I want in the world. Eric Voorhees, who's a friend of mine, said we were debating, I guess, Peter Schiff and Nora Rubini. But what Voorhees said, which I think is so brilliant, is I can email somebody in Russia the money if I need to. I can email somebody in Antarctica the money if I need to. I can e email somebody the money in China if I need to.
and the the money has caught up to the communication, right? So if in 1830, we started the telegraph and we developed the Morse code and I could send a transmission from here in New York to say somebody in San Francisco, assuming the wires are all set up and it can get there in a blink of an eye, the money always was delayed. It's delayed right now in the banking system, but it's not delayed with this. This, this, this is now we're in the age where the money has caught up with the technology and can be delivered at the speed of light. And it can be delivered in a way that is unbelievably secure. And people need to understand how transformative that is. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the, the invention of Bitcoin is that it's, you know, the code it's unhackable and, um, you know, the proof of work algorithm of course supports that, but, um, you know, I think that that's the innovation, that it's completely uh, secure. And that's why digital gold, it's completely, the security apparatus is just unbreakable. But I think there's also something more going on, which is that it's not just money that can be sent. It's, I think, all value eventually will be placed on a blockchain. And so there's some things that you don't need the intense apparat uh, security apparatus of Bitcoin. You don't need that to send a $5 transaction when you're buying coffee. There might be other chains that are faster for that, right? The final finality of settlement is what's important on Bitcoin. Sometimes if the transaction is enormous, it can take a little while. Uh, I mean, like a minute, <laughs> a while, as opposed to some of these other blockchains where it really becomes, you know, a second or less or whatever it is. Um, so it's a whole new world, Anthony's right, where the value placement on blockchain has been delayed, um, but we're there now. And it's just that there's a huge incumbent community, i.e. the entire existing financial architecture that's been built up over the last 50 years. And uh, you can't snap your fingers and have that go to zero overnight. So I actually think maybe Anthony, you can chime in on this too, but I, I think there'll be at some point, some sort of integration. Um, the, the old guys are not completely going away. I think that, you know, I think you'll start to see them meet in the middle a little bit, right? This isn't this, our space, this digital asset ecosystem shouldn't be seen so much as a threat. It's an opportunity for some of the old guys to adapt and, um, you know, grow their uh, businesses as well. Some of them won't and they'll go away and the smart ones will. And I think we're at the very beginning of that phase. Several big TradFi players are embracing Bitcoin and other digital assets, something no one thought possible even two years ago. BlackRock, the issuer of the largest spot Bitcoin exchange traded fund, is the world's largest asset manager with over $10 trillion in assets under management. Fidelity, the issuer of the FBTC Bitcoin ETF, is a multinational financial services corporation with around $5 trillion in assets under management. Last month, Millennium Management LLC, one of the world's biggest investment management firms, revealed it had the largest investment in the Bitcoin ETFs with about $2 billion invested. Pension funds, hedge funds, insurance companies, and others that rejected Bitcoin at much lower prices are now investing in the space with much more to come. During the conversation, Tapiero shares his outlook on Bitcoin and the US dollar, and how he believes both could swap roles in the coming years. Here are more clips from the interview. Uh, there are 125 other currencies that will go to zero before, before the dollar. So the dollar is the supreme currency and will continue to be, certainly for a very long time, uh, in my view. I mean, it, it's achieved network effect to such a degree, uh, you know, it's almost uh, to the same degree as gold. I mean, gold is something that, you know, every single person on this planet, no matter how poor or rich, no matter, you know, where they're living, everyone knows what gold is. And just a little behind that is is the dollar. So I, uh, I, I, I'm not worried about the dollar. I think, look, Bitcoin is of limited supply. And yes, over the last 10 years, the dollar has gone down 99% against Bitcoin. But just understand this, every single asset that exists in the world has gone down 99% against a Bitcoin. 
right? If you do that chart, Anthony and I have talked about this before, it's not about the dollar going away. It's about investing in an asset where the supply is limited that is a unique asset that uh, is at the core of the entire digital asset ecosystem, the entire digital asset world. So that's something that's very valuable and that has achieved network effect already. So, um, but is the dollar going away? I wish people would stop talking about that. I had this conversation with Tim Draper a few weeks ago. I'm like, Tim, just rein that in. The dollar is not, he says within seven years, I could see the dollar going away. Dollar's not going away. It's just Bitcoin is an alternative, right? And maybe at some point, 20 years from now, you know, the dollar will be the alternative. I don't know. Or maybe, uh, you know, people like to have choice. And look, it's no surprise that the invention of Bitcoin came about after 2008, the crisis in 08. Many people felt that that was not held that was not handled correctly by the U.S. authorities. And there was extreme quantitative easing, extreme um, uh, increasing uh, of the money supply. And people said, you know what? Look, we like gold. We think that's limited supply. Even, you know, 1% a year of supply is increased to the gold supply. Okay. But you know what? We'd like to have something that had a mathematical equation backing it where the supply could not be increased. And so there's no mystery as to why in October 08 and then in, in 09, why a Bitcoin was formed out of that period. So that's what it is. It's an, it's an alternative. Um, the, could it possibly come to dominate all value in the entire world and uh, everything of, of value move to that? I mean, even if it did, take a look at the stable coin market. Right. That's uh, those are, that's fiat currency that's backed by a digital representation, digital tokens, mostly on the Ethereum uh, network. Uh, they're huge. Four years ago, there were zero stable coins. And last year, I think it was almost 10 trillion dollars of mm -hmm. stable coins were settled. 10 trillion. How many things do you know of in the world that go from zero to 10 trillion in four years? Right. The opportunity in the U.S. is for the U.S. to get more involved. All those stable coins are dollar based, right? We don't even have euro or yen. I mean, it's it, it's tiny, infinitesimally small. I think all currencies eventually you'll have stable coins for. Why is there only dollar stable coins now? Because that's the demand, right? So don't you can't tell me oh is the dollar going away? It's not going away. It's just It'll be, it'll be represented digitally. It already sort of is in the old world, but the way it is in the old world is not yet fungible with everything that's in the new world because the old world is, is not residing on blockchain. In other news, on-chain Bitcoin analyst Willy Wu believes Bitcoin is on track to hit $1 million per coin by 2035, spurred by an explosion in adoption. His pinned tweet on Twitter reads, on track for $1 million per Bitcoin, as fair value by 2035. That's if we take the user growth curve as a guide for valuation. Remember I said fair value and not peak value in bull market hype. In the early days, price was slow to catch up to user count. Bitcoin didn't even have a price until the 1000th user came in. Price discovery started with early markets like New Liberty Standard and Mt. Gox. By August 2011, Bitstamp launched and we had multiple global exchanges to properly price the asset. After 2012, price pretty much oscillated around the increasing user count. Wu predicts that as adoption grows exponentially in the coming years, prices will follow suit, leading to a staggering fair value price of $1 million per Bitcoin by 2035, and even higher during bull market peaks. In a more recent post, he adds that Bitcoin will 10x in the coming years and become a global reserve asset like the US dollar and the euro. The tweet reads, The financial world now believes Bitcoin is a fast emerging asset class. Well, asset classes are valued in units of tens of trillion. What this means is the world actually believes. Price will 10x from here. It will rival the US dollar in size. It will become a reserve asset. In a follow-up tweet, Wu notes that these events are mostly likely to happen when global adoption reaches 25 to 
which he believes will happen in the 2030s. Do you agree with Willy Woo's reserve asset and $1 million price prediction for Bitcoin? Please share your replies and comments on Tapiero and Scaramucci's discussion in the comments section below. Also, ensure you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and check out our other videos featuring exceedingly bullish predictions and insightful analysis from some of the industry's brightest minds. Thanks for watching.